9-11, a criminal act carried out by 19 criminals, most of them Saudis as it happened, has triggered a tsunami of hate and bloodshed. Joining us now to place it in perspective is Professor Peter Mori, whose book, Framing Muslims, written with Amina Yakin of the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, explores the stereotyping game being played. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Just this very day in this morning's uh, newspaper, a news of a young Saudi woman uh, found uh, murdered in the campus mm. of, uh, of uh, the University of Essex in, in Colchester. Uh, that's kind of the end point of the process you're discussing uh, in your book. Uh, after all, sticks and stones can uh, break your bones. The names that people are called doesn't necessarily harm them, except it creates the atmosphere in which people are harmed. Tell us about your thesis in your wonderful book. Well, one of the things that we were talking about in the book, really, was the way in which different spheres of activity, political rhetoric, the actions and uh, attitudes of the press, and also popular fiction, film, and so on, they all tell the same sort of story when it comes to Muslims. They all tell a story of people who are at some level untrustworthy, uh, maybe not integrated, and may be involved in terrorist activities. Um, so in, really what we were trying to do was to trace that relationship and then also to think more broadly about how the West since 9-11 has constructed the Muslim as a kind of enemy within with the results that you unfortunately see. Dr Shipman killed far more uh, patients of the National Health Service than all the Islamist plots that have ever been in Britain uh, put together. No one would dream of criminalizing doctors or the medical community because of the criminal actions of one of their number. That doesn't seem to apply to the two million Muslims living in our midst. It doesn't. Uh, and it's also, uh, unfortunately, a somewhat of an indictment of the press from the point of view that there are these kind of bet noir, there are these bogeymen who they, they, they erect sometimes. If you think about... Uh, benefit tourists, supposed benefit tourists, or travellers. And of course, the Muslim community have been particularly subject to that kind of treatment, I think, since 9-11 and 7-7. Assuming there's not a conspiracy, per se, assuming there's not a secret conclave somewhere, mm. how does it happen that politicians, press, popular culture, all end up facing the same way, firing at the same targets at the same time? I think as far as the press go, it's a product partly of the, the sort of protocols and practices, the need to turn a profit, the need to hit deadlines and so on. And so quite often I think journalists fall back on conventions, on the known, on the familiar. And of course if circulation uh, is boosted by a particular type of story, it, it's played out in different forms over and over again. And then of course, again, as, as you might know, there's that kind of almost symbiotic relationship between the press and politicians. So if the press pick up on a particular crisis, then politicians will be obliged to respond to it in, in some way or other. I think you've sort of seen that really with the uh, Trojan horse issue in the Birmingham schools, something that was a, a local issue and was being dealt with locally at, at some, in, in some regards, suddenly became this national uh, moral panic. And the results of that then actually percolate out to the broader Muslim community in other parts of the country. And of course, that makes their life much more difficult. Uh, and now it's over. I mean, last week, this was the biggest story in England because it was England's schools that were being dealt with. But this week, it's gone, it's disappeared. Like the 300 girls in Nigeria, whatever happened to mm. them? Mm. These moral panics, these paroxysms of the media uh, are poisonous enough, virulent enough when they're running, but they're pretty short-lived. How do they come up with the next one? Well, they're like London buses, I think, unfortunately. <laughs> they come along on a, on a reasonably regular basis and sometimes two or three together. I mean, apropos of the, of the Birmingham thing, you know, the, the, the story of the halal pizza scare in the sun, I think only operated and the took Trojan on the, pizza. the Trojan pizza, only took on the, the, the kind of uh, proportions that it did as a result really of being running kind of in tandem with the Birmingham story. So on the one hand, there was a narrative which said uh, Muslim extremists are trying to take over our schools. And at the same time, there was a, a parallel narrative that Muslims were trying to infiltrate our diet. And mm. so it becomes this kind of very strange paranoid 
uh, enterprise, really, which, which, which filters across into various uh, other areas. Underlying it all, though, in a ser serious note, underlying it all is the fact that Muslims generally cannot be trusted. And I think that's the, the master narrative, which is really uh, the problem at the base of this. Professor, you, would you say this is a, a phase, like before uh, blacks were targeted, uh, or Jews, yes, and before yes. that Irish, for that matter? I think it is a phase. We talk in the, in, in the book about a sort of merry-go-round of cultural approval and disapproval. Uh, and sometimes one group will be in the spotlight for particular activities or statements that others find unacceptable. And you're quite right, you know, in the 70s there was uh, supposed, you know, black crime waves and uh, this, that and the other. Muslims obviously have been in the spotlight, in the sun and the merry-go-round as it goes around for a fair few years now. Uh, unfortunately, the difference I think here is that it seems to have gathered an international momentum of a particular kind because obviously of uh, geopolitical events of the last 10 or 15 years and also because of the global spread of, of Islam as a religion. What is really quite often left out, and you find this again with the Birmingham schools thing, is a real understanding of the doctrinal differences between Muslims. The tendency to, tr to say there is a problem with the Muslim community, mm. first of all assumes there is a single Muslim community. And so I think one of the ways in which stereotype works uh, to spread really is precisely because of that tendency to homogenize people. Of course, we're at war, uh, literally war, uh, with the Muslims in many parts of the globe, which, as we argued at the time before these wars were launched, ineluctably would lead to war against Muslims at home in one form uh, or another. And as we're now on a more serious note, when uh, Private Lee Rigby was horrifically murdered on the streets of South London, it rightly was a gigantic media story. Mm -hmm. But just a couple of weeks before that, an elderly Muslim man in Birmingham was himself decapitated. Mm -hmm. It hardly got a mention mm -hmm. in the British media. This betrays a more sinister political agenda, don't you think? I think it does. Again, I, like, you, like you, I would avoid the idea of a conspiracy, but I do think that horrific nature of that attack, but also on a, on a, a serving British force, forces uh, soldier um, was of a particular kind to obviously generate revulsion. But in terms of m newsworthiness, I think the, the, the problem really there is that the murderer in that particular instance, of course, stayed around to mm. proclaim his particular affiliations and beliefs. And of course, then that was picked up. And once again, it was a problem with the Muslim community as a whole. What was overlooked in the reporting of that, I think, was the fact that that individual, in actual, in actual fact, uh, Michael Adebolajo, uh, was actually very conflicted in himself. I mean, I don't know, not privy to any psychological reports that were made on him subsequently, but in his declamations that he was making at the time, he talked about our soldiers going to our Muslim lands. So there was a kind of, mm. you know, tension was, within, within the psychology. Yeah. And yet, that was not really picked up or nobody really focused on that. Everyone focused on him mm. and this was another And he was, of course, uh, a recent uh, a convert exactly. uh, yeah, yeah. to Islam, yeah. had been brought up actually in a Christian household. Just mm. a minute or so left. You talked about film and uh, TV and some of the uh, things in your book, Framing Muslims, uh, look at the popular culture. Mm. Tell us what you mean by the way popular culture, film and TV, f fits into this picture. Well, there are a couple of ways, but the main one is if you think about... Uh, let's take James Bond as an example. Um, James Bond, obviously a Cold War hero fighting against the, the Russians mm. at that particular point. Um, what you tended to get post 9-11, particularly in America, were series like 24, which had a very gung-ho, almost you might say neocon kind of politics underlying them, uh, which then worked to justify certain uh, policies, including things like rendition and torture, which would have been beyond the pale at other times. Mm. So really there's the whole kind of way in which the, the popular cultural discourse, if you like, was affected and has been affected by the war on terror. So that again, Muslims, when they appear, appear as a security threat or as a villain or somebody that has to be countered by the, the forces of the, of the rest of the normal population. Professor Peter Morif, thank you very much.